first of all, let me give a disclaimer. This is not a Mother's Day message. <laughs> it's a... <laughs> This church we're looking at today, the Church of Laodicea, we finished the seven churches. It's the one that's known for that radical statement by Jesus where he says, I wish that you were cold or hot, but you're neither of these. So I, well, what's the rest of that? <laughs> yeah, spew you out of my mouth. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> It, it's a famous church. It's a famous city during its time. A city of wealth, a city of uh, commerce and business, and uh, a church of amazing medical innovation. Anthony Fauci lived there in the city at one time. <laughs> Woo. It, it was the most prosperous city of all of the churches that Jesus spoke to, and they had beautiful homes there. They had a very prosperous uh, textile uh, industry growing and flourishing. It, they, they had a unique um, also industry that had to do with a certain type of sheep that they uh, had there and they, they were a sheep that had a black, glossy wool instead of white. And um, they would make these incredible garments out of this black wool. It was a very coveted thing in that day. They had a medical clinic that was known for not only a, a type of ear ointment, but also a salve for the eyes. And it could only be found, this salve for the eyes, in the city of Laodicea. So people would come from all over. People who had blurred vision, who, who struggled with the cataracts, uh, they would come to this city to be able to see more clearly. And so we pick up this passage of Scripture in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So Jesus comes and he, he kind of describes himself. He introduces himself and he calls himself the amen. And you read that, I mean, right in the very beginning of this word to the church, you know, at the end. It doesn't come at the beginning. But amen is a unique word. And it's a word that translated from the Hebrew is still amen. Wherever you go, the word amen is amen in the Greek and the Hebrew. In fact, wherever you travel, it doesn't matter the language. It's always amen. You, you can go to Ireland and you, you can hear a saying like, uh, this is an Irish saying. Maybe you've heard it before, and if not, it says, may your trouble be as few and far apart as my grandmother's teeth. Amen. <laughs> In Mexico, it's amen. Amen, senor. Same word. In Paris, amen, mademoiselle. Uh, it's pretty weak, I know. In German, amen, commandant. In Chamukla, amen, Bubba. <laughs> See, no matter where you go, it's the same word. In English and Spanish and Greek and Hebrew and Bubbish, wherever you might go, it's the same word. And in the original Hebrew, it meant to, well, it meant to believe. It meant faithfulness, trust, true it's actually the word that you hear Jesus use when he says in the Gospels, verily, verily, I say unto you. It's that word, truthfully, truthfully. Amen means it's true, it's trustworthy, it's a word that captures who Jesus is. He's true, he's faithful. When he would use that word, amen, he used it to let them know what he was saying was carried great significance, great truth, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you. So it's a powerful word. So here in Laodicea, he says the amen is speaking to you, the faithful one. But not only that, he, he also adds to that uh, the true witness and the beginning of creation. It's the same phrase that's used in the opening statements, if you will, if you, if you can kind of, it's the same concept, the same mindset when he says here in this verse that he is the beginning of the creation of God. It's like John chapter 1. We've got a verse I want to throw up here on the screen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And that's what he's saying here. The very, very, actually the same, the beginning of the creation of God. It all starts, here, here's the concept, here's the idea. It all starts, everything starts with Jesus. That's what he's saying. I'm the truthful one. He identifies himself with the church in Laodicea and says, look, I want you to know who's talking to you. The Amen the beginning, the beginning of life, of creation, the foundation, the source of all things, uh, and, and not just the source of all things physical or earthly. Jesus saying, it's me. Not just that I created you and the stars and the planets and the trees and the cats and the dogs, but, but also spiritual things. In fact, one of the great spiritual things he creates is is life for you and I. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. He, he can only do that. He creates a new person. You know, if anyone be in Christ, he's a, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. This is the Jesus that's talking to you and me and the church in Laodicea and says, look, I'm the truthful one. I'm the faithful one. I'm the creator of new life, new beginning, new hearts. And thank God he is the, the one who gives a fresh new start. Aren't you grateful for that? That the Lord can do that? You might be here today and say, John, I would love a fresh start. I would love a new beginning. I would love new life in Christ, a clean slate to start over again. Well, that's what Jesus does. That, that, that's his word. That's his word to us. That's his word to all mankind. He says, come, let us reason together, though your sins may be as scarlet. I can make them white as snow. No matter how scarred you are, how stained you are, how crimson and red you might be from, from those things that you've allowed or brought into your life or decisions you made, he says, I can make it white as snow. There's a lot of guilt in the world. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of pain. You know, you, you, you look around the world today and there's just a lot going on. There's all these different kind of clashes in our culture right now. Think about the, the whole abortion clash right now that's going on in our state. And you might be sitting here today and you say, well, John, I had an abortion. And the Lord can take away that guilt, that shame, that hurt, and make you whole. That's what he does. That's, that's why he steps into the church of Laodicea. It's got some issues. He says, look, I, I'm not only the truthful one, but I'm the one who creates new things in your life. You might be here today and you have a failed marriage. I mean, everybody has a Maybe not a divorce, but everybody has kind of a failed marriage once in a while, right? I mean, you ask your wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> it's, it's just like life, right? It, it's crazy. But the Lord heals. He, 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 he not only gives forgiveness, but he allows two people to, to learn how to forgive one another because of his grace. It's a powerful thing. 
Maybe you're addicted to alcohol or drugs, and it's hidden somewhere in your house right now, and no one knows about it. He knows about it. And he offers, well, he, 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 he offers freedom. He, he offers strength by the power of his spirit. Or you're involved in a relationship outside of marriage or, or adultery or, or something that, that, that you need forgiveness for. This is the one who steps into Laodicea, who steps into my life, into your life, and says, look, I'm the truthful, faithful one. And I give a second chance. See, the, the church in Laodicea Boy, did they ever need to hear about life. For the seventh and last time, Jesus speaks to the church, and, and he says to all of them and to us, look at verse 15 there in chapter 3. He says, I know your works. He said that to all of them. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. I know your works. The Lord, the amen, the faithful, the true, nothing is hid from him. All things, Scripture says, are open and bare before his eyes. And he says this to Laodicea. He says this to me. He says this to you. I know about you. I know everything you do. I know all about you. I know your works. That's a scary thing, thought, isn't it? Imagine it's late at night, you're expecting a phone call from your husband or wife who's out of town or your kids, and you know, you're waiting for something to happen, and phone rings, you don't even look who it is, you grab it, and on the other end it says, I know your works. How'd they find out? Either, either you're, you're frightened by that, there's a sense of shame or guilt, or how do they know, or, or maybe on the other side you're going... Wow, I, I did that unto the Lord. It was between him and I. How, how did they find that out? I, I think not just Laodicea, but the Lord says to you and I, hey, I know your deeds. I really know you. And he looks on your life and says, I know everything about you. When, when you hear that, when, listen, when you hear this coming from him, from this one, from Jesus, when he says, I know your works, what, what kind of rises to the surface in your mind and in your heart? And he says in, to this church, you're not cold, you're not hot, you're You're lukewarm. And here's, a, here's an interesting archaeological fact about Laodicea. Six miles from the city was their water source. And it would travel six miles. And I don't know if you've ever been to, had the privilege to go to um, Israel, but you can go to some sites where they have these ancient aqueducts. And they travel for miles and miles and miles where they would transport water. And it's just an amazing architectural feat. Well, they had one there outside of Laodicea. And the source of the water was a, well, a hot spring, a hot mineral spring. And the water would travel six miles to Laodicea. And by the time it arrived there, it would neither be hot nor cold. It was lukewarm. And so when the Lord says, I, I would that you be hot or cold, he's not saying, uh, well, they were familiar with the, the temperature. And he's not saying to them, you know, I want you to be full on hot for me as a Christian or as a believer. Or I either want you to be, you know, a, a full on for the enemy, a pagan cold. That, that's not the concept. That's not even in their radar. They wouldn't even think that way. He's saying, I wish you were like cold water, refreshing, cooling, cleansing, thirst quenching, or hot like mineral springs that someone can bathe in and find healing and medicinal health and restoration. He said, I, I would that you'd be one of those. Or you could probably maybe paraphrase it more like this. Jesus is saying, I wish you were useful to me. That's what he's saying. 
I wish you were cold or hot. I wish you were just useful to me. I want you to be refreshing and healthy and useful. And as a believer, you and I, called to follow him, to be faithful to him. Here's the amen. Here's the true. Here's, here's the faithful one coming to us. And he says, you know, somewhere along in your life and my life, he, he gives that tap on the shoulder or however you describe it. And he says, like he said to the, the original disciples, he says, hey, I want you to follow me. Come on. Follow me. Not us coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, you can be my co-pilot, or Jesus, you can be my sidekick. But he says, no, you follow me and be useful to me. You ever read the parable of the talents where he says he gave one this much and one this much and one another, and then he, then he comes back and he asks the question, what did you do with what I gave you? Were you, were you useful with what I gave he says to those who are not hot or, or, or cleansing, not, not cold or, or, or refreshing, he, he gives a pretty stern response. We said it earlier. He says, I know your works that you're neither cold, you're not hot, you're not useful. I wish you were one or the other. So then because you are lukewarm, and, and in this translation I have, which is the New King James, he says, I will vomit you. Out of my mouth. Would Jesus use the word vomit? Well, it's actually the closest to the Greek is the word vomit. Or it, or, or it could be this. I will vomit you out of my mouth. In the Greek, it basically means up, chuck, puke, curl, or blow chunks. No, it does, doesn't mean that. But you get the image. That, that's the word, though. That's the word that he's using. It's graphic. And, and here's what he's saying. He says, you're not hot. You're not cold. You're a mixture. That's the picture. You're a mixture that creates this kind of unuseful thing. I, I have a term for it, and, and, and I call it... Um, The Goldilocks Christian. You guys know that story? You know, there's these three bears. They're in their house. There's, there's the papa bear, there's the mama bear, and there's the wee little baby bear, right? And they're sitting down for breakfast, and they're eating their porridge. And the papa bear goes, man, this stuff's hot. Maybe we should go for a walk. You guys heard this story? I'm not making this up. This is a real story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they go for a walk. And while they're out for a walk, there's this little girl, Goldilocks, who, true story, I'm not making this up. She comes, <laughs> she comes into the house, and she's just drifting around the woods, I guess, this little girl. And she walks into the bear's house, and she sees the porridge. She goes, oh, some porridge. She tastes the papa bear, says, that's too hot. Tastes mama bear's porridge and says, it's too what? Oh. See, you know this story. <laughs> and then she tastes the baby bear, said, oh, this is pretty good. And she eats it, all of it. Kind of fool, wants to take a rest. She sees some chairs over there, sits down in Papa Bear's chair, says, it's too hard. Mama Bear's chair is too soft. The baby Bear's chair is, is great, but she's too big for it, and she breaks it. Now she goes upstairs and she sees these three beds, too hard, too soft. This is before PG-13 stories. They had separate beds. And then there's Baby Bear's bed, and it's great. And she falls asleep. She was looking for the, the, the chair, the porridge, the bed that was just right. Not too hard, not too soft, just right. I, I, I got a picture in case you thought it wasn't. See, there, there they are right there. They came home. <laughs> Both. This is a real picture. It's a real story. So, so they came home, and there she was in Baby Bear's bed. And, and I think if we're not careful, we, we could kind of become like Goldilocks Christians. 
looking for that perfect spot. Oh, I, I don't want to be too hard. I don't want to be too accountable. I don't want too many expectations. I, I want to follow Jesus, but I want to look for, you know, a place, a situation that where there's no demands, no involvement, no accountability. And yet Jesus comes. Here he is. He, he's, the, he's the truthful one. He's the faithful one. He, he's the beginning of life for all of us. He's grace. He's mercy. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to step out of your comfort zone, and I want you to follow me. That was his call to everybody. When he called Peter, you know, James and John, he didn't say, hey, guys, follow me. We'll find a cushy little place down by the Sea of Galilee, and it'll be shady, and, and I'll teach, and you guys can get some jet skis and paddle boards, and, and, and we'll have some shrimp falafels every day, and we'll just, we'll just have a great time. And I think they had a great time. But it didn't, he didn't offer them or call them to, you know, a soft, simple, easy road. He didn't say, come on, man, we're going to be Goldilocks Christians. Follow me. No, they had some tough roads. And following the Lord, listen, it's an amazing journey. But it's not always easy, as you know. Some sacrifice involved. I mean, think about Moses. What, a, what, a, what an amazing picture, you know, 40 years in the palace, 40 years. Suppose you grew up in a palace of the Pharaoh for 40 years, so from a child up to 40 years of age, and, and you lacked nothing. Think about that. He lacked nothing. He was the man destined to be the next Pharaoh. He probably had his own chariot, probably had a bunch of chariots had one of those cool boats on the Nile that he'd drift around in with, with servants, you know. Moses, where do you want to go? Here's a palm frond. Like you, like you moms had this morning when you woke up and everyone's <laughs> palm fronding you. He had everything. The, the scripture says he was mighty in word and deed. He had those cool, <laughs> had those cool Egyptian clothes and haircut. You seen those, those cool sandals they wear? He was destined to be buried one day probably in a, his own tomb that would be filled with gold and all kinds of things. He had it all. He had it all. And God called him to lead a different people than the people he grew up with. Called him to lead his people. God comes to him, and I'm sure Moses must have thought, God, I've got a palace. I've got servants. I've got, I've got chariots. I've got boats. But, but in Hebrews chapter 11, it, it says this about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he, came, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches that takes a bit of faith to, to say, well, you know, this is, this is, this is more prosperous for me and, and, and means more. It's richer for me than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward that lie in eternity. That was his call. I mean, he could have stayed in the palace one day, been buried in an amazing pyramid. He, he, he could have. He could have said no. You and I have that ability to say no. But he said yes. And you know his story. One day he, he says yes, and God, through amazing plagues and miracles, delivers the whole millions of people out of slavery. And Moses is out front, and he leads them down to the Red Sea. They're trapped. And I'm sure Moses must have thought as he started hearing the grumbling of the people. He said, God, I thought you were with me. I thought you called me. I thought you were going to make it good. And remember what happened? The Red Sea parted. And this is not a Goldilocks story. The Red Sea parted. And Moses walked across on dry land. And, and God took care of the Egyptians. I mean, imagine if he would have stayed in Egypt. Oh, he would have had it, all the riches and all the pleasures, but you know what? He would have never seen the Red Sea part. 
Never. He would have never seen the manna or the cloud by day or the fire by night or be on the mountain with the, with the lightning and the thunder and the finger of God and the, the Ten Commandments. He would miss all that for a cool chariot. Miss all that for, 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 some, for some gold and some silver. And, and so this is kind of what's happening in the Laodicean church. The, the Lord's come and say, hey, look, there, there's more than just what you're experiencing here in this wealthy, compromised journey of faith where you've become a mixture and you're lukewarm. See, a, a lot of us fall into that camp where I just want an easy road. I don't want any correction. I don't want any commitment. I don't want any sacrifice. Just, just give me the Goldilocks bed, the chair. I want my church to be just right. No expectations, no encouragement, you know, in, in, to do stuff I don't want to do, just, just pats on the back. And Jesus looks at the Laodicean church that had kind of fallen into this. And he says, I'm, I'm kind of sick to my stomach over this whole thing. And look what he says. In verse 17, because you say I'm rich, oh, we've got lots of stuff. I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing. And then Jesus says, but I know your deeds. I see everything. You don't know that really you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, Jesus sees just the opposite of what everyone else sees from the outside. He goes, you're, you're rich, wealthy, have no needs. Jesus says, no, you're fat, dumb, and happy. You don't really see things as they really are. The, the church is prosperous. People have nice homes. They have nice cars. They've got lots of programs. Their friends they hang out with are very comfortable. And Jesus says, but I see it so differently than, than you see it. It's kind of like picking up a pair of binoculars and looking through one end. I, I say, wow, everything's close up. Someone else picks them up and looks at them to the other end and goes, whoa, everything's so far away. And Jesus is looking at it totally different than they look at it. It'd be kind of like if you went and played golf with me. I haven't played golf in a while. If we went out and played golf after we finished, you would say, man, I'm not that bad of a golfer. <laughs> well, compared to me, you wouldn't be. But if you went out with Bubba Watson or someone like that, you might say, I don't ever want to play golf again. Right. <laughs> Things are good, but Jesus says, no, no, not really. He says, I've called you to be useful in my hands. I really know your deeds. I, I know who you are. And, and he calls you and I, you know, to be salt, to, 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 to kind of be out there and, and touch the world and cause people to want to wanna know Jesus and not, not just be an assault shaker, to be a light, to, to shine into our neighbors and the people around us and who we work with and all that, not to just shine on each other. Hey, you're looking good. Wow, you're bright. Wh whatever it might be. <laughs> That's pretty weak. Um, but to shine out there in the darkness. He gives them some advice. He, he says, I counsel you, in verse 18, to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments. I know you got the cool, glossy black ones. But white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. They had wealth. And that's what they trusted in. We have need of nothing. But he says, buy from me. What he's really saying is this. You need to receive from me. You're receiving from all these different things that are in your, in your life, but uh, it, it, I'm sufficient. He says, not your gold. 
You, you need white garments, not fancy black wool. It doesn't cleanse. It doesn't forgive. My garments are cleansed by me and for you. You need me, he says. Your prosperous money is good. The ISAF business is killing it. But you don't see yourself. See, Jesus is this master storyteller. He'd always take something that was germane to that area that he was at. And when he was telling them about himself or telling them about spiritual life, you know, he, he would have just, you know, multiplied fish and loaves and gathered his disciples together. They want to make him a king. And he would say, no, 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 I'm the bread of life. Or he would meet with a woman at a well who had had a difficult, painful life. And he would say to her as they're there by that place of refreshing that water, he'd say, I'm living water. He would draw these analogies. He would go to Capernaum where they, where they built millstones. And he would say, if, if one of you offend one of these little ones, it would be like a millstone put around your neck and you'd be thrown into the water right there by the Sea of Galilee. He would tell stories that people could relate to. So, so here he's, he's saying to Laodicea, you can't see your need. They, they had the eye salve. They were known for healing eyes and known for giving sight. But he says, you can't see. He says, you need me to open your eyes and show you what's real. So Jesus is given this, this powerful picture, and that, that's what he's doing. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. See, see now, tune in. It's Mother's Day, so we're going to end a little early. Happy Mother's Day. At, the, at this point, he, he says, look, I, I'm not saying this to be angry at you. I don't say this to be mean to you. I don't say this to condemn you. He says, as many as I love. Love, he says, will sometimes correct. If someone really loves you, they will speak into your life. If someone really cares about you, they'll draw some lines and boundaries for you and go, hey, what are you doing? If, if someone really, you know, wants to see you do well, then they're, they're, they're willing to, to, to maybe kind of step into the relationship and, and, and say something that, well, no one else wants to say to you because they don't really care as much as the person who loves you. I mean, that's what a parent does. Parents sometimes have to step into a child's life and, and speak things that they don't want to hear. You, you saw the little video where, where the kid said, you know, she'll, she'll say yes sometimes when dad says no. I thought, boy, they learn early how to work it, don't they, back and forth. <laughs> they know which one. And if you're a parent or a mom here today, you know what it's like to love your child enough to say to them certain things they don't want to hear. And this is what Jesus is doing. He says, as many as I love, I'll tell them they're lukewarm, that they're not useful to me. I'll point out what they've fallen in love with me besides me. I'll give them the truth. And, and I won't do it in a way that... that condemns, I'll do it in a way hopefully that restores because he closes this out in verse 20 by saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He doesn't say, okay, I'm kicking it in. I'm coming in. I, I'm going to straighten you out. You're toast. No, he says, I'm just going to stand here. And I got a little picture. You've all seen this picture of Jesus knocking on the door. There's no handle. He doesn't. He can only be opened from the inside. Famous picture, the, the knocking Jesus. He, he doesn't kick it down. He very lovingly and gently knocks. And look what it says. Not only is spew you out of, your, out of my mouth a famous verse, but this one, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And, and in the Hebrew culture, the Jewish culture, dine with him was a very significant thing of inviting someone literally into your life. And he says, I'll come in. Not to in any way demean you or 
put you down, but I will dine with you. I, I, we'll have a relationship together. It'll be a restorative one. And he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And it's not like there's a bunch of people who don't have ears. He's speaking to us on the inside. If, if you have the desire, if you have the openness and the willingness to listen, he says, then, then hear what the Spirit says to you. I love this passage of Scripture. It's it, the, whole, the whole Laodicean church, very convicting. He basically calls them to, to repentance, to change their mind, to change their direction. I know your works. I know what you trust in. Here's who I am. And now I come to you, and I, and I knock. Do you, do you remember that time when... when you first began to hear the knock of the Lord on your heart. I'll never forget it. Young guy, high school dropout. 60s. The Lord began, I thought, what, what is this, you know? You're reading Cahill Gibran and all these weird books, and you're going through this spiritual thing, the 60s, with all this stuff happening, and suddenly this, 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 this thing that you always thought was weird and dull in the church, and what is this, Jesus? And he begins to knock and begins to appear in all kinds of ways in your life, and he says, I'm just standing here knocking. If you open the door, John, I'll come in and give you what you're really looking for. You're not going to find it in drugs. You're not going to find it in all this stuff, the music, and all the stuff you've headed down, and it's all been a dead end. And I love this about Jesus. Sometimes he'll let you get to a dead end. And he'll say, I know you never chose me, but I'm okay if you choose me last. I'm okay with that. Not many people are okay with that. You know, you interview about six people, and you finally say, no, 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 no. They're like, like why did you choose me? Well, you're, the, you're my last hope. Jesus is okay being your last hope. Isn't that amazing? And he's, he's the amen. He's the beginning of all things. He's the one that offers a new life. And he's the one that says, oh, I could kick the door down. This is who I am. But I'll just stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open it, I'll come in. And it won't always be easy. But I tell you what, it'll be an amazing journey, and you'll see things and experience things and find truth about things that you'll never find down that other road. And maybe you're here today, and the Lord's been knocking, He's been calling, He's been offering forgiveness and restoration, and He's maybe been saying things to you because he loves you and wants to save you from a lot of heartache. And he says it right here very clearly to me and to you, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. See, see, has the Lord ever rebuked you or chastened you? He certainly has me. It's an ongoing thing. And he does it because he loves us. And then he adds this to it. So if you hear my voice... If you have an ear, then listen to what I'm saying to you. And basically, he's saying this, because I love you, and I have a life for you that's more than the silver, it's more than the gold, it's more than the prosperous things, it's more than you saying, I'm rich, I become wealthy, I, I really don't need anything. He says, no, 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 that, that's a miserable road. It'll end miserably for you. Hear my voice, open the door, let me come in, and let's have a meal, let's have a relationship together that will last and bring fruit and, 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 and will be something that one day you'll look back and go, man, I am so glad I opened that door. Aren't you glad you opened that door? 
Aren't you glad he's gracious and kind and loves us enough to correct us? That's who he is. And that's how he approaches this final church that has become a mixture and they don't even see it anymore. And I pray for you and I pray for me. Lord, give me eyes to see like you see who I really am and ears to hear what you say to me that I might be willing to open the door and let your love correct me.